The scripture today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Hear the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. There was a colleague of mine in Ohio who told me this story a number of years ago. This is what they said. It said, 30 years ago, I was serving on staff of a large church as the minister of Christian education and youth ministry. And the education and the youth council were made up mostly of parents who worked with me on programs for youth, you know, children's Sunday school, vacation Bible school, those kinds of things. And one year for a vacation Bible school, we decided to do things a little different. We decided we were going to set up a big, giant tent out in the parking lot of the church. You know, that way they could have their opening program there under the tent each morning. uh, And it was going to be a wonderful thing. And they would have their songs and their singing. And they, of course, would have the tent to shade them from the sun. They'd get the kids all pumped up for the classes. So they were going to have one of those big tent companies come and set it up. And, of course, the tent companies would pound those big stakes into the asphalt, and then at the end, they'd take them up and they would patch the asphalt afterwards. Well, a couple of weeks before vacation Bible school, the chairman of the church trustees called. And he told me that we could not set up a tent on the church parking lot because the stakes that were to be driven into the pavement would do too much damage. So I met with my council of moms and dads. We decided, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just moved the tent out onto the the front lawn of the church, and we thought, this will be great because, you know, the cars going by, they'll they'll be able to see us, and it'll be a great witness to the community about what's going on. Uh, You know, the kids could still sit on the grass, maybe on blankets, and that'll be great. And then two days before vacation Bible school, the chairman of the trustees called again. We could not put the tent on the lawn because the shade and all those kids tromping all over the lawn just might kill the grass. And I was told that the church was built to be used and we should hold all of the VBS gatherings and classes in the church building. Well, the sanctuary and the offices were the only rooms in the church that were air-conditioned. So since VBS is in July... And I wanted, I told the the chairman of the trustees, I wanted to hold our opening in the sanctuary instead of the fellowship hall. Guess what he said? (laughs) Nothing doing. We're not going to have all those kids tromping through the sanctuary every evening, wearing out the carpet, messing it up. And besides, it's way too expensive to turn on the air conditioning every day for VBS. And my friend pointed out that You know, we turn on the air conditioning for wedding rehearsals and weddings and other events when adults were going to use the sanctuary. He said, well, that's completely different. I said, by the way, while we're on the subject of air conditioning, I'd like very much to buy a window air conditioner for the nursery. I don't think it's fair for the parents to worship in cool comfort while their children in the nursery are sweltering in Ohio's summer heat and humidity. And he responded that it would cost way too much to air condition the nursery. And I told him that I thought his priorities were messed up. (laughs) And he told me that I should do my job, which was to teach and lead the children and youth and let him worry about how the building was used. She told me that battle went on for the six years that she was at that church. Somewhere along the way, taking care of the church's property 
became the primary focus of that man's life. Somewhere along the way, he had forgotten the whole purpose of the church. Somewhere along the way, this friend of mine said, he had forgotten the words that I was teaching to the children down in that hot, humid fellowship hall. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. Now, Jesus was not unaccustomed to that very kind of problem in his day. The scribes and the Pharisees that constantly hounded him were something like that trustee who was my colleague's nemesis 30 years ago. Only the scribes and the Pharisees didn't think that their religious faith was about the building. They thought it was about the law. And in the passage that June read for us this morning, we heard Jesus referring to the law against murder. And then immediately following in that passage, there is the law against adultery, the law governing marriage covenant, and the law governing business contracts. Now the scribes were the lawyers of their day, experts in the law, what it said, what it meant. And the Pharisees, they were the liberals of their day, and they believed that the law had to be interpreted anew for each generation, depending on the context in which it was applied. For instance, if the law said, you shall not commit murder, they would spend hours defining the meaning of the word murder. Was all killing murder? Or was it murder only in some circumstances? And what would those circumstances be? Certainly killing another person would be considered homicide, but not all homicide is murder. What about self-defense? If your life is threatened and you kill someone in defense of your own life, that's not murder. And what about if you kill someone in defense of another person? Or what if it turns out that your life actually was not in danger, but that you thought that it was in danger? And what if the reason you thought wasn't even reasonable? And what makes a reasonable fear or an unreasonable fear? Do you see where this is going? A simple law, thou shall not murder, becomes volumes and volumes dedicated to enumerating all of the occasions wherein you are allowed to murder someone without being charged with murder. A law, the purpose of which was to simply keep people from killing each other, ends up as a list of occasions wherein people can kill each other with impunity. And Jesus looks at what has become not a relationship anymore between God and his people or people and one another, it's become something else. They've lost the, the idea of relationship between the God who gave them this law. And he says, look at what you've done. You have missed the whole point of the law. It's not about how obedient you are or whether your disobedience is covered by some exception or some loophole. The law is not some cold, indifferent, impersonal set of rules and regulations. It is personal. It's about how you treat each other. It's not about rules. It really is about relationships. Now look closely at what Jesus says. Now he's going to use hyperbole here. That's what he's doing when he's sharing this story. What is hyperbole? Gross exaggeration. Here's what he says. Murder? He says, forget murder. Even if you're angry at someone, you've committed sin. If you call someone a fool, you're going to hell. Get right with each other before you even think about getting right with God. If you can't even get reconciled to your neighbor, how can you expect to be reconciled with God? And then he goes on in the next example. Adultery, he says. Forget adultery. You treat women like they are things to be used for your sexual amusement. But you think you're sinless because you don't actually have sex with them. Think again, big boy. 
If you thought your eye was leading you to break the law of Moses, what would you do? You'd pluck it out. If you thought your hand was causing you to break the law of Moses, you'd cut it off. But it's not your eye, it's not your hand that caused you to sin. It's your heart and your mind. Your inappropriate attitudes and your mean thoughts are keeping you from having healthy relationships with women and poisoning your associations with the opposite sex. Jesus is saying it's time to start plucking out those attitudes. It's time to start cutting off those inappropriate ideas. Stop spending so much time trying to figure out how to divorce your spouse and spend that time and energy figuring out how to to live together and love one another. And for crying out loud, stop worrying about giving yourself some wiggle room in a contract that you might sign. Simply be a person of your word. Operate in good faith so that everyone will know that you are a person who can be trusted And then you won't have to worry so much about finding loopholes for yourself and closing them for everybody else. See, he says, all this time you were so focused on the fine print of the law that you thought you were being a part of God's kingdom and you thought all that was about was about not breaking the law. You spent all of your time with your eyes glued to the law so that you could sort of dance on the very edge of it without falling off. But it's not about the law. He says, look up. Look around you. Step back from the edge of the law. Take a broader view and see the big picture, and you will see how clearly that while it may have one time been about the law, now it's personal. It's personal, he says. It is about your relationships with your brothers and sisters. It really is about how we treat one another. Early in my ministry, I worked with a lot of teenagers. I was at First United Methodist Church of Sanford, and in my early 30s, we were, that was a long time ago, (laughs) we were between youth directors uh, one spring, the youth group had about 15 kids in it, and it was spring break. We decided we were going to take a trip to Bush Gardens for the break. And I was sharing in this ministry with a woman until the new youth director arrived. Well, there ended up being two major problems with our outing plan. One problem was this, that the woman who I was sharing this ministry with got called into work two days before the event. The other problem was Drew. Drew was younger than most of the other kids, less mature, rather socially awkward. He was a nerd. He came to me at church and told me that he didn't really want to go on the trip because he just couldn't ride any of the rides that went round and round or up and down or around and about. Just couldn't do that. Those kinds of rides made him sick. Well, that description covered about 80% of the rides at the park. And I knew that those were the rides that most of those other kids who were going on the trip were going to be spending all their time either on the rides or standing in line for the ride. So I suggested to Drew that he might want to bring a friend along who felt the same way that he did about those rides. Somebody who could just hang out with him. Maybe one of his cousins. Well, Tuesday rolls around, <coughs> excuse me, and they met me at the church parking lot. The weather was absolutely perfect, kind of like today. I was looking forward to kind of strolling around, watching people, riding some of the tame rides, answering my cell phone ringing, (laughs) (laughs) sitting on the park bench, maybe reading a book with the kids while the kids were out there sort of dashing around from roller coaster to roller coaster. Well... That Tuesday, Drew shows up with one of his cousins, Bill, in tow, and all seem to be right with the world. <clears throat> we get to the park. We enter with no problems whatsoever. We parted with these instructions to them. <coughs> Excuse me. That they were to stay in a group, or at least with two other persons. They were going to meet me at 1 o'clock for lunch, after which they could have the rest of the day to ride the rides. 
Well, off they went. Things uh, were going really well for the first couple of hours. I got to do exactly what I planned. I was walking around. I was people watching. I was eating. I was reading my book. And then during one of my strolls, I came upon Drew sitting alone on a park bench. Drew, what are you doing here by yourself? Waiting. Who are you waiting for? The other guys in the group. Well, where's Bill? Well, he's with them. See, they talked him into trying that ride, Kumba, and he decided he liked it, and he doesn't want to ride the tame stuff with me. I said, so he abandoned you, huh? Yeah, I guess. Well, about that time, the group actually all ran up, and they were breathless, filled with joy and laughter, sharing excitedly about whatever ride they had just been on. And I watched Drew brighten and smile for a moment, and then as the the group sped off to another roller coaster, Drew's smile disappeared, and he sort of slouched back into his bench. thought about that book that was sitting there, one I'd been looking forward to reading. Put it in my backpack, put my arm around Drew's shoulder, said, well, kid, I guess it's just you and me. And we spent the rest of the day together, about eight hours, me in my early 30s, Drew in his early teens. We we rode the water flume, the carousel, the bumper cars, and the train. We ate ice cream. We played whack-a-mole and about a dozen other games. And and we came very close at one point to actually winning something. And we talked. We talked about parents and religion, about high school, about how high school is going to be different than middle school. We talked about how important or maybe not so important it is to be popular, about how little brothers are a real pain. <laughs> we talked about food allergies and the Gators' chances of making to the College World Series, about what kind of careers were available these days and, and on and on throughout the day. And when we finally dragged ourselves into the van that evening, Drew put on a happy face, told the rest of the kids how much fun that he had had with me, And I admired Drew's ability to put a positive spin on what surely was a terrible day for him. Well, I got home late and fell into bed vowing never, ever to go on another field trip without another adult coming along. In fact, I was thinking about never going on another field trip. It was five days later I saw Drew and his parents at church. Drew waved at me from across the room. And during coffee time, right after service, it was Drew's mother who came up to me, and she she actually hugged me tight. She said, I just want to thank you for for everything you did for Drew at the amusement park. Drew, she said, had not stopped talking about what a wonderful time he had. You know, she said, we can tell them things a thousand times, but we're their parents. It wasn't until he heard them from you that he believed them. I'm so glad he has you. I mean, who knew? Who knew? I never would have guessed that a day hanging around with me could trump Bush Gardens. (laughs) And I told this story to some friends, and Mark, who was a who was a young guy fresh out of seminary, said this. I guess when you get right down to it, personal relationships trump just about everything else. And you see, I think Mark is right. Because it is personal. It's about relationship. Relationship with Jesus. Relationship with yourself. Relationship with one another. It's not about rules. It's not about what's right or wrong in your eyes. It's first about relationship. Without that, we will focus on the wrong thing every time. So I have a challenge for you this week. I want you to look at your relationships. Take a really hard look at them. Are they loving? Are they strong? Do you treat other people with respect? You see, first, 
you need to ask yourself, how's my relationship with God? Everything else is going to flow from that if you don't know it yet. How's my relationship with God? And secondly, do all of your other relationships, do they honor God? If you look at them and you say, you can say to yourself, yes. The way I'm acting, the way I'm treating, the way I'm speaking to other people honors God. Well, then you're in a really good place. But every now and then, we need to remind ourselves that it's about relationship. Let it be so. Amen.